Vanderveld from Illinois. He's uh, raced for a long, long time. He's finished fourth overall in the Tour de France. He is looking for nine seconds on Levi Leipheimer. He finished 11 seconds behind last year in second position. He wants to win this race with a vengeance. Start of the day, 12 seconds separates Christian van der Velde from TJ van Garderen and nine seconds away from Leipheimer. Meanwhile, ahead of the yellow jersey is Christian van der Velde, who I think is pulling out something very, very, very special today. Is this the race for gold for the man who finished in second place last year and lost the event by 11 seconds? He's going to beat 17.56. He's going to set himself up for the win in this race as Christian van der Velde comes up towards the line. 17 minutes and 38. His father, John, who was a great bike rider himself in those days, will begin to feel he's won this race. Hi, I'm Steve Brunner with the Outer Lines Perspective on Pro Cycling. And... Uh, Today's guest is Christian Vandeveld. Welcome, Christian. Thank you very much, Steve. Good to see you. Good to see you too. So, you know, you're, uh, we see you about every week right now, especially with the classics going on. Uh, tell us a little about the conversion you know, you've had. You've been retired for a few years now and what that's been like uh, now behind the screen. And I mean, it's become a little bit more normal now that this is my life now. And I, I think a little bit of the chip of my, off my shoulder has gone away from being an athlete. Um, been lucky enough to find myself in a role with NBC, like you mentioned before. So still being able to, to do a job that I truly love and have a lot of passion for. And luckily uh, I get, had some amazing mentors in there with Phil and Paul and then Bob role, of course, these days. So uh, it, it's been a great transition. I, I'm, I was very fortunate. So when you look back at your career, uh, you know, you had an interesting you know, almost like a first, a second, a third, and a fourth quarter. You know, in that first quarter, you were like this domestique. You know, you're learning the ropes, big, big time talent. Then you had that weird year with Liberty Seguros, you know, which was kind of like the second quarter, which was very short. And then you had the third quarter, which, you know, arguably was like this coming out. And then the last years of your career were just, you were at the peak, especially stage racing. Uh, take us through kind of that evolution of your career, which was a long and, and pretty prosperous career. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try not to bore everybody, but yeah, I mean, c coming back from starting the track, you know, going, doing everything from team pursuit and individual pursuit, and then finding myself on the postal service team in uh, 98, and then having just really going through the roof, you know, uh, you know, think back at postal service with only 14 guys and being, thrown into every race. So that was a great opportunity to be able to race everything from Peru Bay to a grand tour when you're 21 years old was, was fantastic and terrifying all at the same time. Um, and then, yeah, had some great years there and then, then had a lot of physical problems with my back and hips and, and I just didn't know how to address it. Maybe just not mature enough to really take a step back. I always wanted more, always wanted to be in the mix, which I just kept on chasing my tail over and over again. And I found myself out the door postal service and you in Liberty Seguro, so you said, and um, like my father, father-in-law always says, like, that's when you became a man because that's when you had to do the long yards. And it was, it was horrible. I'm not going to lie. It was a, it was a very rough year, but um, probably one of the years that really changed my whole perspective on life. I mean, it was one of those things where I realized how good I had it with the, my American teammates and um, not to take things for granted and put a smile on your face and, uh, appreciate what you have. And, and that's when the work really started, but, you know, learning language skills and, and I wasn't alone. I mean, on that team that year, you have to remember that was on say before that, and then Liberty Seguros. It's like all the, the cool things from that they had, you know, they had Nike, they had, they had Dodge cars, man, in Spain. I mean, that, that, that team was amazing. And then Liberty Seguros like, wah, wah. so I, I wasn't alone. Uh, not having a good time that year. And then, of course, like you said, uh, third quarter being CSC, and, you know, begging my way onto that team with Bjarne Reese and, and really uh, finding, finding a home there. Um, the hardest part really for me towards the end there was leaving CSC because there was no real reason to leave. You were on the best team in the world at the time with a, 
a lot of very good friends, even to this day. Um, and then just taking a leap of faith and going with JV and Jonathan Waters with a slipstream organization. But for myself, it was the, the best decision of my life. So true or false, <laughs> testing at U.S. Postal Service, you had some of the highest marks uh, of anybody, even above people like Lance. True or false? Uh, okay, true. True. And so through that, when you're a young guy and, you, and you're producing really good numbers, and obviously you were a really fluid rider, I think that's the one thing people could see in your pedal stroke, you know, throughout your career. When you have those testing, those type of numbers, your domestique, what goes through your mind in the evolution of, hey, when is my turn? You know, you're, you're young, 22, 23. You had a lot of other good young guys on the Postal Service team as well. At what point do you say, hey, you know, where do I get, when do I get my chance? Especially with Grand Tours. Yeah, I, I didn't think like that back then. I was just really happy to be a part of the team. Um, I mean, it was so new and big. I mean, 99, you think that we, we were still like the bad news bears. I mean, the fact that we were even contending for the win was, was crazy really at the time. Um, so, I mean, we didn't have a high power team and we were definitely up against the ropes many times, but we just really played a good card most of, most of the time. And, and back to the story, I think that you're alluding to with the testing. I, I never knew that I actually won that test up at this mountain. And it was just, it, 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 this, this story has got a little out of control as well. It was just a test at training camp in January. It wasn't like, it was like an end all. It was only like three days before the Tour de France or anything like that. So, but yes, I, I, I was, but Johan was a smart guy. You know, he knew he wanted to keep, um, you know, forward progress with Lance. And so he just told him that he won. It, it was a great decision. And I, and I think about that at, and I have to take my head off to you on for thinking that this the psychology involved with trying to keep that swagger about him, you know, that he is the best and, and just keep that going forward. But I didn't learn about that until I think I retired. I mean, I, I didn't know about that. I think George told me a long time ago. Um, but yes, that, that, that is true. So then fast forward to 2006, you win the tour of Luxembourg, you know, and that was definitely a, you know, I don't care what anybody says, it's coming out uh, party uh, as a stage racer. And then you even leapfrog into 07, second at the Tour of Georgia. And I remember that famous huge breakaway, it got to like 29 minutes uh, going into Chattanooga. And then 2008, which was this banner year, you know, you had uh, the fourth place finish in the Tour de France. You won a, uh, as I recall, a stage of the Circuit de la Sarthe. You were uh, podium on the, uh, well, you won the Tour of Missouri. You got the poster right in back of me here. So, I mean, and, and, uh, and even the, the Tour of California are on the podium. So what was that breakthrough? Or was it just, hey, I had the right opportunity. And finally, like you said, you know, back, I know you had a lot of back and hip issues. Like everything sort of came together. Yeah, I really did. Um, I think first and foremost, I became a father the year before. Um, and then taking that leap of faith of leaving CSC that I was speaking about a second ago um, made it everything real. And that I realized that this career wasn't going to last forever. And that I really wanted, if I was going to start being professional, you better start doing it now because your time is limited. You're getting into your thirties right now. And, um, and really just the fact of being a father, I just wanted to make, just like I was proud of my dad's career. I wanted my kids to be just as proud of my career. So thinking about, you know, what they're going to think of their father later on in life. And that, that really struck a chord with me. And then of course, you know, just leading the team. Um, I, that was a lot, you know, I, and I knew it was going to be a lot on my shoulders and, and it was a lot, a lot of, I have to give credit to Jonathan Vaughters as well. I mean, he put me out there. I, I, that's not my natural state. I, I don't like to be there and I don't like to tell, dictate to other people. Um, I got more and more comfortable in that role later on but at the beginning it was hard for me I was not used to being in that role I was used to being in the role of subservient so it takes you know a lot of first of all just confidence I mean, straight up confidence to, to, to believe in yourself and I didn't really have that belief until it was right there and and every day that it got a little bit stronger and until yeah I was top five on the tour and so in 08 looking back absolutely do you think hey, that was a crescendo of my career, was uh, the fourth at the tour? Or don't you look back at your career and say, well, it kind of, it was a like 
kind of the totality of everything you went through. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it was a lot of totality. I think that's well put. Um, it, it was a, you know, I think 09 probably would have been better if I wouldn't have crashed and broke my back in the in the Giro. Um, I think I was that was, but you know, could have, would have, should have moments. It, it doesn't really matter. So, uh, but yeah, I think it was a long time coming, putting all those pieces together, all those things that you learned, all the things that you've learned over the years that you don't even realize you have. And it just finally comes out and it all takes a little bit of confidence in yourself and, and a team who believes in you and, and have a good time with the guys that you're, you're racing with and voila. I wonder if people realize how many injuries you had and they, they came at really odd times, you know, in the grand tours, right? You had multiple crashes uh, that either uh, even going down to the last tour in 2013, right? Um, do you look back and, and with some regret on any of that or is it, hey, that's part of bike racing? I mean, there's got to be a, some bittersweet components to the way you ended some of these grand tours. Yeah, I, I do. I mean, I think in a perfect world, and especially watching the way that people or all these riders prepare for these races these days. Yes, of, of course I would, but I just didn't know. I was always the one who was trying to make it happen, see how fast I could recover from an injury. And a lot of times it was the worst thing I could have possibly done. If I were to just take an extra week off, an extra month off and recover properly, I wouldn't be putting myself in a situation where I could hurt myself again. So um, the, the Giro crash had nothing to do with it. I mean, that was just bad luck. It ripped all the spokes on my wheel and I land on my back. But, um, but yeah, there was several times that, well, okay, that where I did crash and I did do the Tour de France and I, I got a top 10 six weeks later somehow. It's probably the worst thing I've ever done to myself. I wasn't the same for about a year and a half after that. I mean, it, I really beat myself up really bad. Um, did some things to my back and body that pushed it really far, but I was so fit still that I could use that carryover to still get me to a top 10. Um, but that said, until really mid 2011, I wasn't, I was a shell of myself. So yeah, I do have regrets as far as how much I push myself as far as that goes and how much I put on my shoulders to be back into the racing. Um, and in hindsight, I would have definitely given myself a little bit more time, but I, I'm just not wired like that. I just, I guess I don't have the patience. I remember talking to you at the 2012 USA Pro Challenge, which you won, mm -hmm. and I know what you had gone through and the just the PT to get back to where you were and calibrated. Um, you know, that's something you don't hear a lot from uh, from pro cyclists. You know, tell us this kind of like the psychology behind that and what it takes, because it wasn't just one time, it wasn't two times, it was multiple times in your career. And like you said, hey, I was trying to fast track it. And sometimes yeah. that's not always the best thing. Yeah, it's more of, you know, compensation injuries is, is really, for lack of a better term, is what I had. So let's say you break your right hand collarbone, you're, you're using it, and then you start being twisted on the bike. And I'm hypermobile, so it's really easy for me to, to just make it uh, make a difference on the bike somehow, some way. And I could still ride, and I could still ride pretty fast, but I'm not riding efficiently and not how you're supposed to ride. Um, the human body is amazing at compensating in different ways if something's turned off or turned on. And um, I guess with the injuries and coming back over and over again, the underlying thing is that it's not just training. It's going to the chiropractor. It's going to the gym. It's going making sure you get massage therapists. It's it's a 24-7 stressor. Um, you know, if you're watching with Taylor Finney, it was, it was the same kind of thing. And it's not just me or Taylor. It, there's all... I would say 90 some percent of the, the riders out there, it's part of the job. It's part of being an athlete to come back. Um, but with myself, I feel it was a little bit more than the average, average rider at the time. And yeah, that definitely, I think if anything in my career took a toll mentally was, was just that always, always having to, to grind that little bit harder. And, you know, everyone has a, a glass and it depends on how full it is. And this one was not, not so full after a while. Um, but it, like you said, though, in 2012, everything kind of started clicking again and, and it was working to perfection. And I just was having a, a blast riding my bike again, but it was a long time coming to get back there. So you're one of the few Americans that if you took the, the big tours in the U S that has been on the podium of all those races, you won pro challenge, you won tour of Missouri, you were on the podium, twice uh for tour california um you know looking back is that something you kind of relished uh racing on american soil and then you know getting to that level uh where you knew hey 
the podium's within reach. And so, you know, look back and maybe compare and contrast those three races, which were, you know, all of them were kind of dramatically different. Uh, you know, Colorado altitude, you know, California for obvious reasons and in Missouri, which was kind of this outlier of a, you know, hilly course, never fly. Yeah. Oh, I was actually riding with a guy this morning up in Nashville and, and uh, we had this same conversation about where, where the state of cycling is now and, and where it was when I first started my career, just having Redlands and we're kind of, kind of back to square one a little bit in, in that sense. But first and foremost, I was very fortunate to have the amount of races in the United States that I did during my career. Um, especially when we started, like I said, there was, there was really nothing. Um, but in the, in the meat and potatoes of it, it was, it was fantastic. Being able to race at home for me was huge. And I, I guess it's apparent now when you do think about the results. And I honestly have never really thought of that too much, Steve, but I guess you're right. I mean, I, I definitely put my best foot forward and I really love racing at home, you know, being able to, if I want to go to IHOP in the morning, I go to IHOP and just sleep in a big bed. I don't, I don't, I just, it, it just really brought me to the next level. I, I don't know what it was, um, but I really, really did enjoy it and made sure that I was trying to do my absolute best coming into any of those races. So yeah, it just shows you how fast or so how strong mental side is to the sport, right? I mean, just being able to be turned on and you go back to Perry and get your teeth kicked in a day after a day after you did well at Tour of California. So you ended your career with a DNF that, well, you crashed, you know, uh, looking back at 2013, did you think, Hey, it was about time. Uh, or do you think, uh, or did you have, eh, maybe I can pull one more year out of this. What were your thoughts at the very end of your career that last year or two? Well, honestly, I was, uh, I was ready to retire at the press conference and tour of Colorado. I was like, you know, I, I don't, I don't think it's going to get any better than this. You know, I, I'm just going to drop the mic here and, and say goodbye. And then I was like, yeah, yeah, I, sh I should still do one more year and make sure, uh, you know, do one more, more, one more lap around the, and it was great that I did it because I reminded myself how hard it was. I had, it was riddled with injuries. I had a lot of bad luck. Um, and just, that just put a nice bow on everything. They're like, no, don't second guess yourself. This is definitely the right decision that, that you're making. And, and Steve, I'm very fortunate to be able to, to at least call time out on my own career. I mean, I'm, there's a lot of athletes that, that don't get that. And yeah, I'm very fortunate to have 16 years over in the pro peloton and, um, I'm very glad I didn't have 17. Let's uh, switch gears and go back in time a little bit to where you started. So your dad tells a story when you were 13, you really wanted to race and, you know, you were into other sports like a lot of kids are, whether it was soccer, swimming, you know, uh, but you want to get on the bike and he kind of withheld you until you were 15. But when you were 15, you were on the track and won, you know, uh, you beat seniors at a national event. And so, uh, you know, look back and say, was that a good move now that you're a father? And then what did that do to kind of alter your hunger for the sport? Did it just give you a, more of a launching pad when you're like 16, 17? I think for the time and the place and where, where it was in, in the burbs of Chicago. Yeah. I think it was definitely the right move. Uh, and now the sports are different. I mean, uh, we have this conversation all the time with George and Kevin. His son Enzo is uh, is flying on the bike, and it's it's getting annoyingly fast. And it's uh, he's starting to to put us through our paces already at twelve, which is not okay. Um, so you know, if I look at him, what he's doing when he's twelve years old, and what I was doing is is I could have never come close to what I did. Um, so I think for for my personal uh, for where I was mentally. Uh, in the sport and even geographically where we lived, I think it was the right thing to do. And, and his mentality, my father's was that he wants me to be the best 25 year old, not the best 15 year old. And, and I, I understood that um, a lot. Th that said though, I, I knew so much about the sport inside and out just from the people who'd walk in the door, you know, I mean, Ochi comes over for dinner and then Danny Van Hout the next day, or, you know, even like we're talking about Mike Plant would be over there. I mean, just there's the people who I knew just because their dad's friends um, and, and what I knew about six day racing and going to different races for my birthday parties, things like that. So I already knew so much about it. So when I did go and finally race, it wasn't that hard to evolve quickly. So that's, that's a little bit different as well. When, when they have somebody from whose dad's an engineer or whose dad, you know, was two time Olympian. Yeah. I think you definitely had the influence of the Southeast Wisconsin, Northeast Illinois mafia yeah, I, in that time. It was all, I don't uh, think I had a choice in hindsight. Now that I think about it. 
Yeah. And so looking at your own family tree, you know, you got a brother, he may be the strongest of you all, you know, uh, with what he's gone through. You've got a sister who was, you know, national, if not world class. And you had your dad that was uh, a two-time Olympian, you know, walk us through your family tree and, you know, you're, you're world class, but you got some uh, pretty good uh, lineage across the board, especially maybe some inspiration, uh, you know, with your brother, especially what he recently went through. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, even backing up my my grandfather, my my great uncles, they all rode bikes and they raced um, on on fixed gear bikes and criteriums way before before Red Hook criteriums were taking place. Uh, they so they do that in Chicago and race the track, and then so I already always looked up to those guys. And they all we were on the Sunday rides, and those rides still exist today. And you know that they started back in the '60s uh, in the burbs of Chicago. And then, but yeah, but my immediate family with my sister racing after me and. Uh, her, she lived across the, the hallway at the Olympic Training Center from me. And then, like you, you brought up my little brother. My little brother had two liver transplants. Um, and then, he, fast forward and way until just 15 years ago, he started racing his, his bike in the transplant games and actually destroying people out there. And he would race with us. Uh, he'd ride with me quite a bit, but he, he's, a, he's an actual, absolute brute on the bike when he wants to be. And yeah, he just had some surgery a week ago, so I can't wait to go see him out in LA. But he was definitely an inspiration to me, you know, thinking about what he had gone through and um, at the time and, and really just not just him, but really everybody at home, you know, thinking about you're, you're out there, you know, just trying not to let them down. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely was there, was there was quite a few times where I was racing for Ian. That's great to hear. And I hope he's, uh, you know, recovering. I know he just uh, went through a procedure a couple of weeks ago. So uh, I'm sure you'll be glad to see him, especially with COVID now kind of winding thank down. Yeah, thank you. Uh, tell me the story about your dad says when you were 16, maybe 17, that this was the time he thought, man, I think I have something on my hands. And he was referring to you. He was moto pacing you. You're going about 45 miles an hour to his recollection. <laughs> and you told him, Hey, keep, you know, push it up a little harder. Uh, and so do you remember that story? And you know, how old were you And 45 miles an hour? I don't care if you're descending is still pretty fast, let alone moto pacing. Yeah. I love my dad's stories. Uh, you know, like I, I have to differentiate exactly when they were, maybe the date's not exactly right. Um, I do remember, I remember motor pacing quite a bit with him I and mean, he had a, a green Ford Explorer, <laughs> which looks, I mean, you think of Jurassic Park when you see that thing and, uh, but he'd have the hatch up. So being inside of it was really a test of will when you're when inside the bubble behind a, a car like that, because it doesn't take much. It's really much more so just leg speed. Um, so I think it was more that I was insane than, than anything else. And I had really good leg speed that. I wanted to go faster and faster and I just wanted more. And uh, I think that's a testament to the reason why he held me back because I was kind of nuts, you know, when I was a teenager, as far as I went and um, I had to wait to catch up with my, my skill a little bit before I killed myself, I almost killed myself during my pro career. Like we just talking about. So uh, that really, I guess really never caught up, but uh, yeah, I, I think there's a, a few times there that, you know, he, he gave me the opportunity and uh, if I was willing to take it, I, I took it and then it was off the races. Something to be said for being on the track when you're young and then converting to the road. Yeah. And what are your thoughts looking back as, you know, as that decision? I wasn't happy about that um, at the time because I, I wanted to be a road racer because all my, all my, the people I really looked up to was was on, on the road, but I, at the same time, I love the track, but it was again, geographically, you know, how was I going to do a stage race? How was I going to climb a mountain? You know, there was nothing around me. So it was a great stepping to go through the program of the national team, um, which happened, you know, organically as well. So being lucky enough to win the points race as a junior, like you said, in the, in the and then got thrown right into the Pan Am games and the, the national team from there uh, was absolutely perfect for me. I mean, I learned, I learned so much about myself as an athlete, um, being training so much, uh, pacing for the pursuit that which helped out in the time trial, um, the, the discipline and, and training helped out for being a stage racer later on. So it was like kind of going to 
a four or five year college when I think back of what my the process was as as a team pursuit team and again luckily enough for myself that was during the lead up into the 96 game so we had we had some money we we're really pushing the team pursuit hard it was part of the project 96 um formation back then so that was good timing as well to be able to be a part of that that great formation there so what's more painful team time trial and uh, the four minutes or so there or the last four minutes of a uh, major oars category climb in a grand tour it depends on how the team time trial is going because if the team time trial is going very well most like a lot of times it doesn't hurt as bad ironically um but yeah i mean you go through some pain but i i love the team time trial i mean i think that was i i lived for that event um i always felt good in that event um and we have some of the best memories, you know, winning events or coming close to winning those kind of events. But there, yeah, there's no pain when you're by yourself and you're not a true climber and you're starting and you're just trying to hang out for dear life in a above category climb. But, you know, some days you're the hammer, some days you're the nail. And that's exactly what the team time trial is about. And especially, you know, gunning and trying to finish in the top five of the Tour de France. Those, there's nothing like that of, of counting down the kilometers towards the top of a hill. Um, but at the same time, when you know that you've got the other guys on the edge and accelerating away from them, there's no better feeling either. So speaking of the tour, your form in 08 and 09, um, people were saying, God, he's, he's just a different cat, you know? And did you feel like all of a sudden you're climbing, going back to your point, had hit a certain level that it hadn't been before. You're always like a massively good, you know, time trialist. Uh, you know, I think people recognize that. And so what was that conversion? Was it, you know, part of mental or was it all physical? I think, I think a little bit of both. Uh, again, back to what I was saying earlier, it's, it's having the confidence to even try and put yourself out there that you could even achieve those things. And then second of all, yeah, of course, it, a lot of physical, you know, um, really looking at out after yourself, diet, of course, getting down to a race weight that you truly can achieve. Um, and, and be strong still. I mean, not, not just lose weight to lose weight, but to still be very powerful on the bike. So I think it was a little mixture of both, but yeah, that was the, that was the, the most physically fit I'd ever been for those, those two years. And like I said, after that, I, I'm, I just got back there at the end of 2012 after having a pretty rough tour de France, but you know, everything clicked again for tour of Colorado. And so the, you know, the question would, have to be asked, you were on American teams did extremely well. You had the Liberty Seguros. The CSC team was, you know, you could say it was more European. Did you feel more comfortable on American teams? Was that part of it? Why, you know, it's just, uh, or not necessarily? No, not really. It was really just the, the cohesion in the, the camaraderie really with, with a team that that's, that's where I really thrived and, and not having that camaraderie. I just didn't, I didn't like it that much. I, that's, that's really what, one of the biggest reasons that, that I was there in the first place. Cause I, I loved it so much. And it was CSC, which I was talking about earlier. It was, it was fantastic. That group of guys, that guys that we, we still have zoom talks, like during COVID we've been have all nine of us together and we're already planning some crazy trip for Stuart O'Grady's 50th birthday. So it was a, it, that was a special group of guys. Uh, not, not that every, every year of my career, we didn't have a, a special group, but that one I'll, always sticks out for me. And um, so, no, it's, it's not necessarily being an American team. I mean, speaking English helps. Now that, that's a different story, um, but it's not necessarily uh, being surrounded with a bunch of Americans. That's not, that's not really what, what made me tick. It was, it was a camaraderie. So speaking of camaraderie, uh, Greenville's built up uh, quite the retired elite peloton uh so give us an idea when you guys go for a group ride if it's let's say you bobby george and uh you're going up paris mountain yeah. who's more fit right now and yeah what's it well okay like? uh, i'll give you the cliff notes real quick so so uh i was the last to retire right so I'm, I'm the youngest by a little bit from all those guys um so i had you know re the residual fitness a little bit longer Bobby had retired already in 08. So I already had five years of racing after that. Um, and so when Bobby came over here, he, 
he, he he hadn't written that much. He just wasn't into it. Where he was so he was so busy coaching people at, at either uh, Tinkoff or he was at Sky. So he he was full of gas. He wasn't really riding his bike that much. So when he came up here, we he had a 1998 Kofidis helmet on his head in this shitty bike, and and he was I'm not saying he wasn't fat. Obviously, Bobby Jules will never be fat, but he he wasn't in shape, and so he shifted, I don't know, 15 pounds of fat to muscle. Now, now, he, now he's, he's the same weight he was when he won pair of knees. So yeah, but Bobby's a, he's gone overboard now. So he's, he's, a, he's gone from yin to yang. So yeah, he's really fit. So I don't know. Now I need to start riding even more now, but yeah. And George, I don't, I don't think he's ever taken a week off since he's retired. So, yeah. uh, but it, it's great having those guys around, you know, the days that you don't, really want to ride and somebody to drag you out and you always feel better when you get back home. So it's, it's, it's more of a therapy session than anything else. Now the difference, if it's still the case, you live more towards the center city in Greenville and those guys are a little bit pushed out. I know George is for sure. Uh, you made a cognizant decision though, to live in the city, correct? Mm -hmm. And that was a lot to do with, you, you love the walking part of that, you know, and give us a little insight on that versus maybe, those guys living out in, uh, for, you know, for cert certain, yeah, a little bit. Uh, yeah, no, I think, I think my, my wife and I, we just love being able to, to get into the town a little bit easier. And, and we were, we were lucky that we did do it at the time. And the hardest part, see, we used to live in Chicago when we were picking up our place. So to be honest with you, we didn't even know which outside place to be with. So it wasn't like, I was a, a genius <laughs> stretch of imagination, but thank you this. It was really like, what's the smartest move and how can we build a house, you know, 700 miles away and, and hopefully be in, in a good spot. But yeah, we love where we are here. The quality of life has been incredible. Um, but I'm going to stop talking about Greenville because we're, we're, we're getting to capacity quickly. Switching gears a little bit to your TV career. Um, you know, when you were young, a guy like Paul Sherwin was coming over. Your dad played a major role. Maybe people don't realize in the whole Motorola connection and how that team got started. And then Paul as communications director. And then eventually, you know, he was already, you know, into his uh, career uh, as a television commentator. Any influence looking back or was there a little bit of rub of, hey, you know, I saw what Paul did and, you know, give us that history that you uniquely had with Paul at a young age. Man, this is like Oprah now. You're going to try to make me cry. Uh, yeah, I mean, Paul used to start, man, he, when he first came over, I have to think about that. It was probably 90, I think 91, I want, I want to say, is the when Motorola came about, I want to say. Yeah, something like that. Um, so he was coming over when I was a freshman in high school. Yeah, freshman junior or sophomore in high school so him coming over for drinks and or dinner whenever he came to town because Motorola of course is, is from Chicago he'd be up in Schaumburg um and so he would always stop by and say hi and you know tell some war stories and regal myself and my brother and sister about you know growing up in the bush in Africa and snakes and all these kind of things that he would kill out there and we would just be like this guy's insane you know like <laughs> we were, I mean my sister remembers every story I mean she, she's got a, a brain like an elephant so I, I love uh thinking about that in the transition of all the years and uh, I remember Paul stopping one time when we were in, in Rio in 2016 calling the Olympics and he's like isn't this crazy that we're together here? I mean, I remember you and you're, you're this big and you're like, I mean, I mean, who, who would ever thought in it? And to hear him think about that, because I thought it all the time. I like, I think that this whole trend, whole thing was always nuts. You know, my first year being in Colorado with you guys and, and calling that race and, and, and I would be driving those Phil and Paul in the car. And I'm like, what has happened? You know, like I, I've been listening to you guys since I was eight, you know, at home. And now I'm with you guys. So it, it was very surreal. Um, I don't know if I ever thought of that I would be following the path of Paul or anything like that. I don't think that ever crossed my mind, but it was always nice to have Paul in my corner. And I, I don't think I was alone, not just because he knew me since forever. Um, but it was, it was just that that's just the way he was. He was like the glue at NBC or the glue of any place he walked into. He's the guy who remembers the name of the janitor. He knows, he knows everyone, you know, by name. I mean, for, okay, th this is one, uh, and I'm going to stop at this, but I remember when we would call the, uh, 
would it be the world championships? It was, it's the worst week that we ever have because we call it live from sign in all the way through. And so we're up at two o'clock in the morning every day and it's brutal. And I come down to the lobby in the crappy Sheridan in Stanford, Connecticut at two o'clock in the morning and everyone and the bar is just closing, mind you. And Paul Sherwin is in there howling with these guys from Nairobi and they were in from in Uganda and somewhere else. And he's speaking better Swahili than those guys. And th these guys are just, their minds were blown that who's this white dude in here speaking Swahili and just blowing us away. So and that, that, that's just, that, that was Paul, you know, it was, it was just, you know, two o'clock in the morning. Why are you wired this way? So yeah, he, he was a, a force in nature and, and we miss him greatly. Yeah, no doubt. Probably uh, like the Dos Equis guy, the most interesting guy in the world. <laughs> very you close, know? very close. So now you're in the booth with Bob. You know, I think uh, anybody who's a cycling fan has been following, uh, you know, the spring races here. And uh, it's become this American booth now, at least certainly early in the season here before we get to the tour. And so the dynamics of that, you know, seem to be working really well. And uh, yeah, I think you guys are playing off each other well. You know, take us inside the booth because you, a lot of people know you when you switch your hat and you're sitting at the analyst desk. And yeah. so it's, it's gotta be two distinctly different forms of announcing, I'm guessing. Very different, very different. I mean, I, at, the, at the desk, it's a little bit of, you, you watch everything go down, collect your thoughts a little bit download what you think went right and wrong. Um, maybe a little bit of Monday, Monday morning quarterback kind of thing, or, or at least before the race, you're, you're guessing what's going to happen in the stage. And, you know, calling the race is a little bit different animal. And I don't have too much seat time when it comes to that. Um, but I love working with, with Bob. And I, I think what we're just bringing to the table, what's, what's going on in the race and what we love and what we see. And uh, what better job is there than, than that if, if you truly do like it and I do and I love working with Bob as well I mean he's one of my best friends so yeah it, it is cool and I, I think that dynamic does show and my, my goal is every day just to make him laugh at least two or three times because he howls so so hard and it's uh, you know it, he's a he's an interesting dude and his his passion even though he'll he'll play it down for how much he maybe he doesn't like the, whatever the sport but he loves the sport more than anybody out there and, uh, and he's damn strong still on the bike, too. Don't, don't be fooled. That, that, that boy can still move. So Reggie Miller, Bill Walton, these guys are uh, retired basketball players that probably a whole generation don't know that Bill Walton won NCAA titles and an yeah. NBA championship or Reggie Miller was, you know, the ultimate three-point shooter. Has it even occurred to you? Maybe there's an audience out there younger now that don't even realize Christian Vandeveld, you know, was fourth in the Tour de France or Dude. won the USA Pro Challenge. Are you, are you kidding me? Yeah, I, it, it occurs to me every day. I mean, from, I mean, Peloton, for example, like when I, I go to Peloton, people are like, oh man, I love your Peloton classes. And they have no clue that I was really even a bike rider or that I work for NBC. Like they, so it's, it's all these, you know, everyone is in their own world these days. So if you're watching the show and, they might not know that I ever raced a bike before. They might just think that there's some of the talking heads or vice versa. So yeah, I, I think that happens quite a bit these days. Um, but it is interesting to see um, the change in dynamic because when you're a cyclist, you have a helmet and glasses on it and you're a little bit more recognizable and you can see your actual you know, personality for the first time, really. You know, you don't get to really speak too much when you're a bike rider unless you do really well and you get an interview. But even that, you're talking about the race. You're not talking about anything else. So it, it has been interesting in, in the other side of the fence to be um, a little bit more with the public, uh, a little bit here and seeing what their their point of view is. And, and, and really the one that's that's blown me away is is Peloton. I never saw this coming. I don't think anyone saw this coming. If, if not, we'd all be bazillionaires because we would invest in the company a long time ago. Um, but yeah, that, that's one that really broadsided me, um, to seeing how big that was and, and how cool it is to see the transition from people who've never ridden a bike before to right, getting a Peloton bike and then liking it so much that they're getting road bikes and seeing them out on the road. So that's been, that's been really cool to see. So let's wrap it up this way over your shoulder. You've got four bikes and I'm sure people who are watching the podcast are going to go, Hey, what's he got back there? Take us through each one of these and then maybe what you're riding today. Okay. Um, 
if I do this, so this is a uh, got the pink jersey with this in 2008 with the team time trial um, with the two Dave Dave Miller Zabriskie, Magnus Baxter and host of LA characters and Julian Dean. I mean, we had a we had a great crew, Danny Pay. Um, so that that was that was a fun time. That was really the birth of Slipstream because that year that we were we were wild card for the Tour de France. So with, without winning that race that day, I don't even know if we would have done the Tour de France. So there probably would have been no fourth place for me. Um, my favorite bike, bar none, is that's my dad's 1972 um, pursuit bike that I raced um, in 94 and won the national championships on and in the points race. Because, uh, I don't know, probably it was too cheap to give me a bike, so he maybe ride, ride that bike. And so that's a, that's a bike that I rode, and uh, we retired that sometime soon after. See, um, he, he told me, Christian, he wanted you to earn it, quote, unquote, so... I'm, yeah, no, that, fair enough. No, fair enough. I mean, I think I think that's well put. There's no reason to. And obviously, you know, to be honest with you, I wrote they the national team gave me a bike after that, a new bike, obviously, and that bike was still better. I mean, I, I I'll still it was you know because it was before carbon fiber. They're just kind of steel bikes. So anyway, that's that was a great bike. Uh, and then on top, that's my '99 tour bike from Postal Service. Very happy that I that I saved that. And then on the bottom. That's uh, Sean Yates's bike from, I don't know, 92 or 93 from, no, probably not, maybe before that. Anyway, it weighs like a thousand pounds. And, but I, I absolutely love it. That's Eddie Merckx that, um, from Motorola team. And when I, when I drove my, my bike into the garage on the roof rack and broke it to smithereens, I raced that <laughs> when I was a kid, which I had no right racing on when I was 17 years old. I think it had 185 cranks on it or something like that. And I, yeah, my buddy and I won the state championships when I got the ride on that bike. So yeah, that, yes. may, you said it was a tank and maybe that's, that explains why I was able to go, you know, literally about 120 K down, you know, down a major climb. You know, I, I heard he was notorious for. Uh, He's a badass. He, yeah. he still is. So, Christian, really appreciate the time. You know, I think uh, it's been great to catch up. Great stories, certainly, uh, you know, with your family and uh, continued uh, success on the broadcast level now as, as you move forward, especially into the summer months. And I think we're all hoping we see you over in France. It might not happen this year, but uh, certainly for. Uh, 2022 we want to see you guys back over there in France uh, broadcasting well, thanks Dave it was fun and yeah I'm, I'm glad you remembered some of those those facts that I had forgotten most of them so I appreciate the the walk through memory lane we gonna ride it out until it's all the love get you what you want and call me the plug living every day like I 